Hey everybody, good to see you back. As you can see, it's cold and snowing outside once again, so it's the perfect day to spend back here in the shop. And we've got a lot of engine block prep, cleanup, kind of things like that to do today. We're gonna get really dirty, so we don't have our best Sunday clothes on. Oh, no, no. We're getting ready to work. So here's our lineup. And just a quick refresher. These two blocks are the ones I had sleeved back to standard size. The gentleman that did the job left them slightly undersized because I am going to finish off and fit the pistons with the hone, establish a good crosshatch. After he pressed the sleeves in, they crunched in a little bit, so he took the boring bar and just trued them out slightly undersized. And boring bars do not leave a good finish. If we could magnify in and get a really close in look at these cylinder walls, you would see like threads that have been cut all the way down with the cutter bit on that bar that's not conducive to piston rings that'll wear rings out really fast so we'll get the final cross hatch established on these take them out the final few thousands fit the pistons these will be ready to go the third block here has some heavily worn standard bores in it we have water damage besides we have that score line right there it catches your fingernail pretty heavily so we need to take these out with the hone about another 12 thousandths and i have a 20 thousandths oversized set of pistons that will fit to this aside from that of the three here this block is my first choice to use on 1113 because it's that old 4b666 that old devil block as i call it first gen original if for some reason i don't like something about this I'll fall back to this one for 1113. Of the three blocks here, this is in the best overall condition. So it is the newer part number, but if one would have been replaced sometime, you know, through the years, it most likely would have been this anyway, so it's still not technically incorrect. Um, this one right here, this is gonna be like a pet project because there's a lot wrong with this block. There's a lot of rehab that's gonna have to be done to it. It threw a rod at one point in time. There's a lot of resulting damage on the inside and yeah caused by not shutting the sediment bowl off after you've uh, quit running it and then the fuel gets down into the crankcase thins out the oil and these things only hold a quart they are a splash lube system only and they run at 3000 rpm so you dilute that crankcase oil catastrophe is not far off so it's a pretty good cross section of well what you can do with these things this one's going to be a right correct and proper back to book spec book procedure rebuild this one is going to give us an opportunity to address a common problem you'll see on these and that is a damaged front main bearing bore from that bearing having loosened up and spun this one well i'm going to show you what you can get away with <laughs> So I'm hoping that this rebuild series will be helpful to people because two of the three blocks on the bench right there represent a pretty good cross section of what you can expect to find on these old tractors. Hardly any of these starting engines made it through six, seven, eight decades unscathed. You know, they were just a bare bones design to begin with, only really engineered for like approximately 250 hour service life. And a lot of them were abused. So this middle block is not typical um there's really not much wrong with it and it should be hopefully a pretty straightforward rebuild these other two we're going to get a little bit involved so to start this middle block actually still has that front main bearing in it and the dowel is even still in place so i haven't been able to show pulling one of those um main bearings out of the block yet because we already had this one disassembled from well a couple years ago when we first tore it down and we pulled that bearing out at that time this one the bearing just fell out so let's get going on this so the first thing i need to do is drive that retaining dowel out i'll just use a small punch work from the inside of the bearing it's moving already all right yeah this is really not a robust design at all this bearing bore literally depends on that dowel remaining in place. Once it falls out, oh, my pliers are too big. Once it falls out, this bearing can start to spin. And then when the bearing spins, it hogs out that bore, and then the crankshaft in play becomes excessive, and then your timing gear backlash becomes erratic, and then it always breaks the magneto shaft. So there's our dowel. Now to pull the bearing, I'm going to use the hollow ramp. Don't have to, but I want to. 
This is your safest setup right here. So I had this long piece of pipe that the bearing's gonna fit inside of, and my long piece of threaded rod goes through the ram, through the pipe. I've got a disc against the bearing back there, so ram's gonna pull on the rod, rod will pull on the disc, disc will press the bearing up into the pipe. And this is the safest way to do it, to avoid any damage to the block, because you're only exerting pressure, or exerting force on the bearing and the block material immediately surrounding the bearing. These usually aren't in very tight and I've just pressed these out in a press. I just set the block on the press table like this and just press straight on the bearing and it usually comes right out. But you're still putting pressure on this webbed area where the, the main seal cutout is back there. So this is just a way to be absolutely sure you're not gonna hurt anything. There's the bearing. All right, we're ready to begin honing now. So we're gonna start with the block that has those worn standard bores. We're gonna to have to take about 12 thousandths worth of material out of each one of those cylinders in order to fit those 20 thousandths oversized pistons. To do that, I'm starting with a very aggressive 70 grit set of stones in the hone. So that's just for rapid takedown. The goal here is to get this bore within a few thousandths of desired size, just like the sleeved ones are. And then we'll switch out to a finer grit hone that will do the final sizing and establish the appropriate crosshatch on all six of those bores. Um, yeah, I put it in the engine stand here because, well, to start off, we're nervous, we're taxing it a little bit, we're not sure if it's gonna handle the load. I'm optimistic, but yeah, it's just a good fixture for it that's gonna keep it solid. I don't have to try and clamp it down to anything. And I can rotate each bore that I'm honing upright so that all the swarf and everything falls through and it's not getting recycled between the stones and the cylinder wall and stuff like that. Another thing, this has come up in the comment section before when I've honed, personally, I prefer to hone dry. Most people prefer to have some oil in there. Oil's gonna have your stones last a lot longer. Some people get a better finish with oil in there. I personally have better results honing dry to each their own. These 70 grit stones just shred cast iron. It's unbelievable how quickly they cut. And it only takes the first couple passes with a rigid hone like that to illustrate what the wear is like in the cylinder bore. And this is pretty typical. You've got the shiny areas here. Those are the high areas where the stones are already removing material. The darker areas are the low spots where the most wear is. We're not even yet contacting those areas of the cylinder bore yet. And this is pretty typical. All cylinder bores wear like in a cone shape. So they will all always wear the most up at the top end and they'll stay truest to spec down at the bottom end. And a lot of it has to do with, you know, the piston comes up, the rings of course are, you know, playing a part in that. But when you compress that air fuel mixture and it's ignited, the pressure is going to seat those rings tightly out against the cylinder wall as that piston goes back down. You just get the most wear up at the top all the time. And yeah, you can see all the way around the bottom down here, we're, we're concentrically around yet. We are consistently taking material out of the bottom. That's everything below that ring travel. You can even see bottom dead center right here where that piston would slow down, stop, and then pick up speed and start heading back the other way. We're wore pretty low down there too. So all this is pretty standard. We'll be able to cut all that out, but to keep track of where we are, I mentioned these 70 grit stones really take out the material. I've measured all this stuff. I know where we are. I know where we have to be, but you've got your inside gauge, bore gauge you can use to uh, take periodic measurements. We have the, the taper indicator and all that stuff, or we can do it the simple way. We have a go, no go gauge already factored into this 20 over piston. This is the one we're gonna use. So 
we just need to make that fit. Once we have just a light slip fit, as soon as it goes down into that bore, we know we can stop with the aggressive 70 grit stones and we switch to the uh, the 220s to uh, to do the final sizing and uh, put the crosshatch on. But you might be wondering why the portion where the rings go will slide in, but the rest of it won't. That's because on any piston, the crown gets the hottest. So the areas around these ring lands are always a lesser diameter than the, the main body or the skirt. So once this thing heats up, you're going to have a differential of expansion. The top is going to expand out a little bit more than the rest of the skirt. And all of your clearances will be optimal once you get this thing up to temp. So that's why that part fits, but the rest of it is a no-go. So that's how to do it quick and easy. Okay, just checking our taper. Yeah, we're... Uh, we're perfect. That bore is already concentric. So all I did was one more um, pass through, just like I did uh, prior to this that you just watched. And look at that. We've pretty much taken all the low spots out. This thing, we've pulled about five thousandths out. I've got my um, bore gauge, my taper gauge set at 2.750. We've already ripped five thousandths out of that cylinder wall. And I've only got like two actual minutes of honing on this. And we've got pretty deep score right here it's you can still catch it pretty good at the top with your fingernail i'm pretty sure we're going to be able to cut that out if we don't uh this little engine's not going to care i mean we're, these aren't race car engines these are like you know a glorified lawnmower engine is all they are you're not even going to know that's there but i think that's coming out we got a little bit of that water damage here some minor pitting i'm pretty sure we'll cut all that out too but this is kind of fun just watching it change and you know we're just cleaning it up renewing the surface Let's carry on. We're getting close. It's just starting to dance in there. So we'll go easy on it now. All right, we're gonna clean everything here. I think we're pretty close. I just honed one more time. That thing's awesome. Get the grit out of the bore because I suspect the piston is going to probably just fit. All right, here's our gauge. Yep, look at that. It, it just, just fits. I don't want to scar it, it's pretty tight. So. That means we're done with the aggressive 70 grit stones. We'll swap out to some finer ones and establish the final cross hatch and set the clearance piston skirt to cylinder wall. And through the magic of editing, we have the finer grit stones swapped out in the hone. I've also rotated the block with the other cylinder up because there's something I wanna show you here to be mindful of when you're honing on this side. But this is a 220 grit set of stones. That's what I prefer to establish my final cross hatch. And for years and years, the Hastings Ring Company has recommended a 220 to 280 grit stone range to handle. That's your general range where you can handle like cast iron rings, chrome rings, or even molly rings. So I prefer the 220. 
Um, these are probably just cast rings in here anyway. 220 is going to be just fine for that final cross hatch. So the other thing I want to show you when you're honing the cylinder that has the dipstick tube next to it on these blocks, you have to be mindful of the bottom of the cylinder bore. Now, it's not wide open like this one is. You can stick the hone as far out of this one as you want. It's not going to hit anything, but this one's offset to the point it'll hit this portion of the block right here if you get the hone too far down. So that can cause damage not only to the hone or to the block. So what I did here is I made this little bump stop. So what this is meant to do, when the hone gets down to a certain point, that button on the end of it will hit that block and it's set to where the stones are still coming out of the bottom of the bore. And it just, just sets in here just like that so it really can't rotate, but it's a perfect fit beneath that cylinder. That's your bump stop right there. It's gonna help keep you from damaging anything. Okay, it's some time later. I've honed this out three different times, checked it, and we're finally where we need to be. It takes about as much honing with those finer grit stones to do the last few thousands as it does with the coarse grit stones to take the majority of the material out. But we have a pretty generous clearance spec piston skirt to cylinder wall. It's four to six thousandths desired. I shoot for right in the middle. That's a five thousandths blade on feeler gauge. So I'll start it down alongside the piston. We get it centered in and we have just a nice snug fit. So that's right where we're gonna land for our clearance. And I flipped it back over again because I wanted to show you all, you remember that heavy score line that was in here? That completely cut out as well as all of that water damage, that light pitting that was down in the bottom of that cylinder and good cross hatch. Really happy with how those bores ended up. And once I fit a piston to a bore, I'll make sure it stays with that bore. So you see I got a number one written on there with a Sharpie marker and a number two. This is a habit my brain got into with Ford Motor Company. This is just how I always reference these things. You can see these cylinders are offset from one another. This would be the front of the engine. This would be the rear with the flywheel on it. The forwardmost cylinder is always number one and you count back from there. So number one, number two. Pretty easy to keep all that straight because that's just how I do it with all of them. So you guys know what the process is. We've got the most difficult block done because we had to take that one out the furthest. I just need to use those 220 grit stones on those other two sleeved blocks just to establish final cross hatch and get the clearance of the piston to the cylinder wall. It's just gonna be a few hours in the shop here. Don't need to show you all that. You you know what I'm up to anyway. So catch back with you in a bit. Okay, everybody, this is the third block. We've got the other two done. So I wanna show you something first. We got nice cross hatch there, good finish. Nice cross hatch there, good finish. And this one we haven't honed yet, it's noticeably duller. I wanna show you something, let's give it the fingernail test. Now listen, you hear how it just kind of scrapes on that cross hatch bore? Now listen to this one. You can hear it sounds like a zipper, kind of a prrrr. That's just an illustration of the circular ridges that are left for that boring bar. They're just little peaks and valleys. If you cut a cross section of that, it'll look like a sawtooth edge. So that's what we're having to get rid of. Well, all right, everybody, I think we're gonna about wrap it on this episode. We managed to get all three blocks matched to their respective pistons. So traditional old school first gen fashion, first gen block, first gen plug style wrist pin pistons, NOS standard size, standard bore, the updated 5F block, updated circlip wrist pin pistons, NOS standard size, standard bore, and in this one, We've got our used but still very good 20 over pistons, honed out 20 over bore. I told you all, this is the one I'm gonna show you what we can get away with, right? So yeah, I can already tell you doing three of these at a shot is gonna be a lot more time consuming than just being able to bang through one of those. But these three engines should give 
a lot of good examples on how to overcome some of the common problems you're going to see some of the damage you're going to find when you get into these d2 d4 opposed twin cylinder starting engines so yeah we still have main bearing bore rehab to do on two of those three and the valve seats need to be retouched on all of them not sure which of those two directions i'm going to go in next but it all needs to be done so thanks for watching everybody hope to see you back again